So there's so much to talk about, we'll, we'll jump right in. So Jack, you've helped lead Notre Dame through some really tumultuous times. And I, and I often say, even when you're not around, that you were the perfect person at the perfect time for Notre Dame with the skill set you have. From the Campus Crossroads Project, launching Fighting Irish Media, to the moves within the ACC, Under Armour, and so many others. More recently, you had a huge thing on your plate, and that's hiring a new football coach. You chose Marcus Freeman. Tell us about that, and how's it going? Thank you. Uh, you can tell we've only played one game so far. <laughs> um, you know, it was, uh, I said it at the time, that's one of the real privileges of this job, when you get to be involved in decisions of that magnitude, because it's going to impact so many student athletes, it's gonna impact the university, and um, I really get excited by it. I mean, a lot of the questions I get about it is, God, that must have been a lot of pressure. It didn't feel like that at all. It felt like, isn't this cool? I get to, I get to help steer this. Um, and, and as I've said, Marcus was a sort of a clear choice from the beginning, but not because we didn't vet him against a lot of other candidates. We did, with 12 candidates. Um, but the opportunity I had to observe him for a year, uh, the opportunity I had to interview him for four hours, and most importantly, the opportunity I had to talk to our student athletes. And I have talked about that, and I talked about it in my introductory press conference, but when I look back, on my time at Notre Dame, those 45 minutes with those students will be right near the top of the list. <clears throat> they were prepared, they were eloquent, and they were passionate. And it made such an impression on me because as I said at the press conference, their message wasn't hire this person or that person. Their message was, we have built a great culture here. The players built it, not the coaches and we're, we're counting on you as the athletic director to maintain the culture. That made Marcus, who represented that culture so effectively, even more compelling. And so it moved pretty quickly as a result of all those factors. Thanks, Jack. Um, I have a question for, for both of you, and I'm gonna start with Jack, but Lou, it's gonna impact you um, hugely you. as well, and that's the whole issue around name, image, and likeness. Right, and, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a conversation starter all over campus. So with the legislation, the dramatic changes, what are your thoughts about it? I'm gonna just open it up. Is it turning our players into, into pros? And Lou, what I want you to then talk about is from a, from a standpoint of how it impacts the work you do, will you now become a fundraiser for, for athletes? Um, so Jack, will you start? Sure. Um... The, the easy answer, it's not a dodge, is we don't know where this all winds up. What happened was a concept that we were very much in favor of. Matter of fact, President Jenkins was the first president in the country, <coughs> now six years ago, to speak in favor of name, image, and likeness for student athletes. And the reason we spoke in favor of it was our fundamental principle that we want students who are athletes to have an experience which is much, as much like students who aren't athletes as possible. We wanna minimize the distinctions between them. Every other student on campus has the right to, max, to monetize their name, image, and likeness. If I'm a talented artist, I can sell my artwork. If I'm a good musician, I can go downtown on Friday and Saturday night and play. Student athletes were un uniquely, among college students, prevented from doing that. And so that was the basis of our saying, yes, we embrace this and we, we think it should happen. What we couldn't have anticipated and didn't anticipate is that it would come to us at the exact same time the NCA collapsed and a number of court decisions went against the NCAA. So now it came online with no ability to regulate it. And that's a disaster, right? Because the notion here, the good notion is that the market ought to work that you ought to get compensated for things that have value in the market. I was talking to a person with, on an NFL team yesterday and I said, how many of your guys have marketing deals? He said, maybe five. You got college football rosters that have 100 people with marketing deals now. The market's not driving that, right? What's happened is this has been converted into talent acquisition fees. 
And that's very problematic. And we're going to continue to focus on supporting what we view as true market deals, um, which is the intention all along, and try and stay away from things that are talent acquisition fees. Having said that, should you think the sky is falling, it's not. We'll get through this. Keep in mind that schools have been paying student athletes for years. Now they can do it in a more public manner. And we've been fine. We haven't done that, but a lot of schools have. And we survived that. We'll survive this. It's especially great to be able to try and navigate this difficult situation with Marcus um, because he's, he embraces the university values so strongly. So um, first of all, it's great to see everybody here. And uh, thank you guys for your leadership of uh, clubs and classes and, and making it back this weekend. We're really excited to see all of you. Um, I can imagine that you are just as interested in the, the future of, of, of athletics as you are about the future of fundraising and alumni relations. <laughs> so it's a little bit of a joke there, yeah, we, yeah but. Um, <clears throat> You know, when it comes to this area, I don't see it as a threat. Some people worry to say, does the development department feel that if we have kind of third party groups, is Brady uh, Quinn's and, and his team's kind of initiative has just come out publicly with that? Do you see that as a threat, as a compete? Don't see it as a threat at all. We can't be involved in, 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 in those solicitations directly, it has to be done outside of the, of the university, um, but do not see it as a threat. Now, I did make the mistake, and Jack can, can share a little bit, I made the mistake of, um, I don't, I'm on Twitter, but I don't tweet a lot. I retweet things, and I, I, I made a, a, a tweet a while ago um, appending something about Texas A&M allegedly spending a lot of money. I trended on Twitter, let me tell you. I think I'm well known to the Texas A&M fan base uh, at this point, and uh, even, who's the head coach there again? Jimbo Fisher. Jimbo Fisher, Jimbo Fisher, Fisher even uh, cited me uh, in, in one of his press conferences there. So there will be no more athletic tweets coming from me <laughs> at this point. We'll leave that over to Jack. Yeah, I got a lot of calls that day. Who is Lou Nani? <laughs> exactly. And what does he do for you guys? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> The worst thing is, is that while well, I was feeling terrible, he could not have laughed harder about the whole situation. It gave him some joy. That's good. What now, I, what, now, what now, I, now who's monitoring your tweets? Uh, the same nobody that was monitoring them before. <laughs> I'm just a lot, lot more gun shy. And, and, and I would add, I didn't have to say anything because Lou's kids had beat him up so badly oh. by the time he got to me. Exactly. So, Lou, the, we're, we're in this beautiful building, and, and, and I have to say that it's, it's one where, I, Jack, I know early on, this was a, a vision of yours, um, and, and I've just, I, I don't know that I've ever told you, so a little confession, I wasn't really sure this was gonna work. Um, I never said that, but it's brilliant, right? It's great, yep. and, and, and so, Lou, you guys have, have done a lot of, um, fundraising, but more than that is, is working with the vision on campus about what's next, what, what do we need, what's, what are the future buildings. So what can you tell us? The, the, everybody hasn't been here since 2019 in terms of this is a three years since this conference. What are some of the new construction projects and what are the thoughts behind them? Yeah, no, it's great. So we have the, you know, we did a, um, a future uh, plan for campus that's renewed on a regular basis. It's 50 years out, 100 years out. And, uh, and everything is lined up around seven basic tenets, that the sacred nature of campus, the whole campus is to be built around quadrangles. It's about architecture style. It's about keeping this as a pedestrian campus so that we are not gonna be building on sites that are gonna be too difficult for a student to walk from point A to point B at any, any time. There's, there's a number of tenets that guide all that, that we're doing. In fact, we even know where the buildings are, go, are gonna go in the future, but we just don't know which buildings uh, will fill in what. Um, some of the newest uh, um, events, that something that is yet to be announced is 
Um, very exciting, we have about a 220,000 square foot interdisciplinary research facility called McCourtney Hall that is across from the library, just to the, uh, I guess, northeast of the library. Uh, that's where we do a lot of our interdisciplinary science and engineering research. We are going to be doing um, a 200,000 square foot expansion to McCourtney Hall that's gonna focus on bioengineering and the life sciences, especially what we're doing in bringing our, our, these wet and dry labs together with uh, data analytics, and especially around the areas of rare disease research. Notre Dame is one of only six universities in the country that focuses uh, intensively on rare diseases. Rare diseases are those that, that afflict fewer than 100,000 people at a given time. You might have heard of cystic, cystic fibrosis, or you might have heard of certainly Neiman Pixie, where we are the top in the world, given the Parsegian family's uh, uh, um, impetus behind that particular disease. But cumulatively, these rare diseases affect between 25 to 30 million Americans every year. Pharmaceutical industry doesn't really respond to them because there's not enough of a market for them. But it's totally consonant with, uh, with, with who we are as a Catholic university. And this is gonna be a major thrust in that expansion. So we're gonna have a 420,000 square foot now research facility, and we'll be breaking ground on that this summer. We're also gonna put in a new dorm over there as well, a new men's dorm. It'll be about a 263 bed uh, men's dorm, to be precise, that will be going in that area. These announcements will be coming forthcoming soon. A lot of that is because we can't get our, our, our transfer students um, housing on campus. And it's, it's a constant refra refrain that it's, the residential experience is so core to who we are and especially if you're transferring in and you have to live off campus, it's problematic. But we are decanting, as the, the term that they use, the old dorms. And those old dorms, Soren Hall is being completed right now. Alumni Hall is going to be uh, uh, undertaking a 14 month project next year. What we're doing is we're putting in more social space, more study space, more workout space in these dorms. And some of these older dorms many of them in over 100 years, we've never redone the HVAC systems. Um, so it's, it's a gutting of these buildings, and then also some of the triples become doubles. Some of the doubles are so small, they become singles, so we lose beds in these dorms. And that's why there's a necessity for some of the new dorms that we're doing on campus as well. I like the idea of decanting. I, I thought that was only wine. Yes, you know so that from the wine. I, I do, I do, yeah. I'm kind of a wine girl. <clears throat> um, so Jack, I have a beautifully worded question here about how we consume media and your visionary view of it. But I think really in the end, it's what were you thinking with the Peacock deal? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I hit a point where I wasn't getting enough mail. <laughs> and, and I said, what can I do to increase my inflow? I picked right. Um, yeah, um, we have to be involved in, and I hope a leader in digital media. Um, while you may have reacted to our decision to have the Toledo game exclusively on Peacock, sort of lost in that was the NFL a couple of months later did their national deal that had games exclusively uh, uh, streamed. Um, the SEC followed and did a deal that has games exclusively streamed. The Big Ten is in the middle of its negotiations. It will do the same. Why, why do that? Well, one is because it's an important form of media and we have to be part of it. We can't, we can't let that develop and be on the sidelines from it. So, how do you make a, uh, how do you engage with it and try and find a balance between the access our fans have historically enjoyed and that? Um, secondly, and in many ways more importantly to us, is we are able to identify you when we stream a game in a way we can't when we broadcast over the air. When we broadcast all, over the air, all we get are demographics, right? 
so many people of such and such an age and such and such a gender. That doesn't help us serve you better. When you stream, we can know you streamed and you have an interest in Notre Dame. And so we can, we can build a better relationship. Everything we're focused on right now, the digital tickets, which I think people were as excited about as streaming, um, <laughs> streaming, um, the content we produce for you, and I couldn't be more proud. I mean, Marcus, there's a great reaction to Marcus Freeman because of who he is. There's also a great reaction because of how FIM covered it. They, they had spectacular coverage of that. Um, that's why we have to be in that game. We can't sit on the sidelines. We'll try and take a balanced approach to it, um, but it's part of our future, and it will continue to be part of our future because the alternative is to be the only one who doesn't include it in, the, in their future, and we can't do that. So uh, may, maybe a little bit controversial, controversial as well for Lou, but, but I'll give you a two-part question, right? The, so on the one hand, uh, Monday, su Sunday and Monday start Notre Dame Day, mm -hmm. which is to this audience incredibly important <clears throat> as, as we all use that as an opportunity to raise scholarship funds, right? Mm -hmm. so, so we get that, but, but Notre Dame has a lot of money, mm -hmm. right? Like why would anybody want to give more money to Notre Dame? Concerns Do you think I'm gonna have a job on Monday? <laughs> Concerns me when you get applause and laughter for your questions, <laughs> not, the, not the answers. No, no, no. Um, it's a great question, and uh, it's, it's one that we wrestle with. I mean, no, Notre Dame is no longer the little parochial school in the middle of nowhere that is trying to kind of fight its way up. I mean, we, we have, uh, have an absolutely incredible campus, right? We've been blessed with buildings and rooms and spaces like we're in right now. We have an amazing endowment. Um, we have been blessed uh, with, uh, I think, probably uh, riches kind of beyond our, our wildest imagination in the one sense. But we also have, more importantly, uh, in our founding DNA, a vision from Father Soren, which from the very start of our, our university, I think it distinguishes us from most. He said, not only is Notre Dame gonna become one of the great universities in the land, but more importantly, one of the most powerful means for good in all of society. So if our mission is just about building monuments on campus, if it's just about building great spaces, or if it's just about improving the academic quality uh, of our different departments and initiatives here on campus, then you might argue that we're, in, we're well positioned, we don't need a lot, of, a lot more money. But that's never been the vision of this university. We are to be leavened for a world that is deeply in need. And I think we are living right now in a time in our history where the needs of this world are as great as they've ever been. So if we understand the backdrop of our mission and what our true calling is to be leavened for a world that is deeply in need, then we have a lot of work to do. We have a lot of work to do to be signs of hope in a global atmosphere where there's so much despair. Whether it's around those rare diseases that we talked about earlier, whether it's about bringing conflict resolution to some of the most trouble spots in the world, whether it's about making a Notre Dame education more accessible to students that are coming from backgrounds of tremendous economic hardship. You know that we're like number one in the country at graduating our first generation and Pell eligible students at roughly 94%. For somebody who lived and worked at a homeless center for eight years and in shanty towns for about five years of my life, I can tell you that the recidivism rate and trying to break cycles of poverty and cycles of, of dependency and violence is exceedingly high. When you find an institution that can break cycles at a clip in the mid 90 percentile, you are in rarefied air. We have a responsibility to do more of that. And we have a responsibility, like in you, to graduate students, alumni, who are leavened for that world in need, who not only lead with integrity and excellence and a spirit of service, in the workplace, but 
are good husbands and wives and mothers and fathers, whatever their particular calling might be, to lead lives of integrity and service. If we understand our backdrop to be what Father Soren envisioned, we're going to need more resources across the board to make an impact on this world. It's what we do with the resources that is ultimately fundamental and important. And I think there's, and the other thing is small donations. Let me just say one thing about it. A lot of people will say, oh, you get the, these big donations and, and the small ones don't mean anything. With Notre Dame in the backdrop, you know last year, gifts of $200 and below, mostly from our alumni, but also parents and friends, gifts of $200 and below provided full rides, tuition, room, and board for 42 Notre Dame students. So the next person that looks at you, and I know your leaders and representatives, and says that a gift of $100 or $200 doesn't matter, ask them to look into the eyes of one of those 42 students that is here because of those gifts cumulatively and tell that student it doesn't matter. We have a student who works in our office. We hire a lot of the first gen and Pell students in our office and he was here, as many of the students, from San Diego and uh, just a wonderful young man. And I noticed that he was here over spring break, right? Didn't have anywhere to go. I knew that he was um, one of the few in his dorm. So we invited him uh, out to dinner with our family twice during that week. And I got to talk to him a little bit deeper and he's a great young man, first year student. So I asked him, I said, how did you, what schools did you apply to and how did you choose them? And he said, well, I applied to schools that I liked their colors. I said, really? I said, okay. I said, what schools did it come down to? And he said, um, I just knew I wanted to get away from home. And I, I got into Vanderbilt, Notre Dame, and Brown. And it was a decision between those three schools. And I said, well, those are really good colors that you picked. Those are really good colors. And I said, how did you choose? what school you were gonna to go to. And he said, I had no idea. So he said, on my screen, I uploaded all three of the websites. And I pressed the button and I said, whichever downloads first, that's where I'm going to school. <laughs> God's honest truth. And Notre Dame downloaded first. I said, we've gotta get you to talk to our web team. You know, cause they, 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 they won that and now, he feels nurtured, he feels a sense of community. He, he's like, he is the biggest champion of Notre Dame. We've got to go out and recruit those students better. We can't leave it to the chance of a website, you know, that downloads faster than the others. We've got to show them and bring them to campus and, make, and we can break cycles in that young person's life and in his family's life that, um, that I don't think any other institution can do. So if we understand that as our backdrop, that the family is much bigger than those who just go to school here, we've got a lot of work to do still. And, and I, I congratulate all of you because you are at the core of that. Yes. And, and I, I, I know that some of you have heard me say this, but you know our Notre Dame clubs and, and a couple of our groups collectively have an endowment that's, Mark Wataki, 180 million. Can I round up to 200? Lou always rounds up. Can I just round up to 200 million? Yes. <laughs> yeah. A couple yeah. tough monsters. We're not talking about lately. And, but anyway, so, so you think about that. If, our, if this group seceded from Notre Dame, you can't, by the way, so don't get your hopes up. If you seceded from Notre Dame um, a few years ago, it's, the number has definitely gone up and we're working on calculating that, you would have been the 382nd largest endowment in all of higher ed. There's not another group of, uh, there's not another alumni association, meaning not us, but you, that, that has clubs that have endowments to the level that you have. So I congratulate all of you. So thank you. And you know, the, you, those endowments are supplemental to what the package a student gets from Notre Dame, financial aid. So that's above and beyond, and that's a, that's a difference maker in being able to recruit students from your areas. It's huge. Okay, I have so many more questions, but I don't wanna get in any more trouble. So I think what we're gonna do is open it up to the audience. And we, I know we have a mic, is it, is it back there? Great, we have a mic back there. But if, you, if, if you're on this side, you have a question, just say it loudly and we'll repeat it. Yes. Uh, Anna from U.S., class of 2006. Uh, I have the privilege and the honor of serving 
on the Alumni Association Board. Thank you all for your leadership. Um, you said something that hit very near and dear to my heart, Lou. Um, you know, this lovely student from San Diego, go San Diego, our local club leadership is over here. Um, but yes, nurturing and uh, validating people's feelings, very much like him, I too chose schools that um, were my favorite colors because I didn't know what else to do. Right. All of that to say, I've heard you, all of you say, there are wonderful opportunities on campus. We are truly blessed as a university to have so many resources. Um, and with everything um, that our lovely Dr. Logan shared this morning about being more inclusive, more diverse and equitable, are we ensuring as a university, not just with students, but with alumni who have had different experiences from others, um, for them to partake or be able to access some of these great resources? And one example for it is being able to hire more diverse talent to become suppliers who can participate in the growth of creating a building like this right. or having access to digital content and being able to engage with audiences in that way. Is there some thought um, in how to bridge that gap and bringing more underrepresented minorities and business owners to partake in some of this growth and have access to those resources? So I can, I can, I can start here real quickly. You know, we just had a, um, a big uh, um, initiative from our board of trustees, uh, which was led by Byron Spruell, a former um, uh, Notre Dame football player who is the president of NBA operations uh, right now. Um, and he led a team on the trustees that, that conducted a comprehensive report on, on, on diversity, equity, and inclusion for Notre Dame, which included many different dimensions, including contracting with um, many, bringing in more of the minority businesses, minority-owned businesses, and so forth for um, either construction efforts or supplying you know, food or, or other types of resources and, and uh, and, and all the marketing of Notre Dame merchandise, et cetera. That was one component part of a much more comprehensive report. The, one of the great things is about that report is that it was presented and the administration was there and we're graded kind of annually by the board. What kind of progress are we making? It's being watched very attentively on all fronts, whether it's the diversity in recruitment, whether it's the diversity in programs. And, and I, I wanna say if I could just real real quickly about this. It's not, because some may, may think about this, this is not just about doing what is politically correct. This makes Notre Dame better. We want to have people with diverse backgrounds, diverse experiences, diverse perspectives, and we want to bring them to the table because when we're able to embrace that level of diversity, it enriches all of us, and it will make us more creative and more innovative going forward. So it's not to be PC, it's to make Notre Dame better and more inclusive. And, and so we're all about that. Jack, can you talk about what's, what's gone on in the athletic department and what you've done? Sure. <clears throat> um, in, 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 in the ability to make this a more diverse and more talented campus, we have an advantage. Our student body, within athletics is more diverse. Um, the professionals uh, who enjoy great success are more diverse. It's up to us to make sure we meet our obligation to take advantage of that. And, and I must say, I couldn't be more pleased. I mean, I, I love that our football coach, our women's basketball coach, and our volleyball coach are all diverse head coaches. Uh, my leadership team has as many diverse members, <coughs> more actually than any other unit on campus. And they have come to us from around the country. Um, and so you not only get the diversity of their experience, but the diversity of their background at other schools. And it makes us so much better uh, when, when we do that. But the chief operating officer of Notre Dame Athletics, Mario Morris, came to us from Wisconsin. He's, he, he's an African American with his law degree, his MBA, and he'll finish up his doctorate this summer. Um, we just hired a head of facilities and events, Tim Wise from Miami. Mm -hmm. JP Abercrombie from Tulane leads all of our diversity and inclusion yeah. uh, and, and meeting the social needs of our student athletes. And, and, and I could go on and on with that list. And so it's not to say to you, boy, 
aren't we doing great? It's to say to you, we better be doing that. Mm -hmm. Because within Notre mm -hmm. Dame, we've got a unique ability to do it. We, we bring a disproportionate number of those underrepresented students who are Pell Grant recipients mm -hmm. into, in, through athletics. And we should do that. It's an, it's an important factor. You know, an interesting thing to remember about college athletics generally, only the GI Bill has educated more Americans than a college athletic scholarship. Uh, it's a powerful force to help, help young people get, get the education they deserve. And you know, the one thing that we're not good at, we're not good at telling our own story about what we're doing because we're just busy doing it. And I, yeah. I think that that's really important. Everywhere you turn on this campus, there are initiatives for getting a more diverse workforce, students, professors, just all of it. We probably need to do a better job telling you about it, but boy, that sometimes feels pretty self-serving. And, and I wanna just say again, thank you to you um, as alumni that are very actively engaged as in, in and also appeal to you, we need your networks. We need you to, to, to help leverage your networks, whether it's among other alumni or parents or friends or in your workplaces. If you know somebody, uh, whether they're of ethnic diversity or any type of diversity, the, our best chance of recruiting somebody back to, to, to South Bend is somebody who already has some experience or love for Notre Dame. So we need to be able to leverage your networks and being able to, to, to recruit very talented and diverse pools uh, for the hires that we have here and, uh, and also recruiting students for that matter um, as well. And you're, um, you're, you've been a real gift to us as an alumni association, but we need everybody to step up and everybody to perceive themselves as recruiters. So how about another question? Yeah, right there. And, and the, just a reminder, um, in, in your question, um, make, them, make them brief so we have as much time to get as many as we can. Jack, talk about the NBC Peacock Network and moving ahead with Notre Dame. Will we start to see, oh, there we go. Uh, will we start to see more home football games on the Peacock Network with the new contract in 2024? Or what, if you had the crystal ball, what do you see uh, coming up with that? Because it's obviously the future of a lot of broadcast sports to be in those pay-per-view type situations. Yeah, too too soon to tell. I mean, we're we're having we're having discussions. We won't have less streaming. I can I, I know that. But whether we'll have more or what form it'll take, um, whether we'll partner with one broadcaster or more than one broadcaster, um, all that all that is to be worked out right now. What what I know and the world knows is that the SEC and the Big Ten have completely separated themselves from the rest of the industry. My job for Notre Dame is to close that gap. And I, I have to do whatever I need to do to get us within shouting distance of those two conferences. Great, maybe one more question. Right back here. Hi, my name is Arthur Lasiak. I represent the Club of Washington, DC. And I have a question, I think Lou would be best for you. So. Several months ago, Notre Dame was named in a lawsuit among other elite universities regarding its financial aid practices. Yeah. I personally was following that story because I was someone who benefited from financial aid at the university. And when I heard that story, I kind of was surprised because it kind of went against Notre Dame's mission of inclusivity, getting more students here. So I was just curious, what is the university's position in that lawsuit? Yeah. So the, just to, re you want yeah. to repeat the no, question? Repeat. So to repeat the question, it was about the lawsuit that was recently filed against a number of schools regarding, um, I would say, financial aid and admissions practices, and, and it seemed to go against Notre Dame. So what, what does Notre Dame think about that? What is Notre Dame doing about that? Yeah, so Notre Dame is, is, I think, one of roughly 20 schools or so that's included in this lawsuit. And basically the lawsuit, as I understand it, and I, if anybody can correct me here, once something becomes a lawsuit, it goes to our general counsel's office and we just kind of follow their directives and, and so forth. So I, I've not uh, delved down too deeply in it, but I, I believe the allegations are that, um, that those institutions that have professed to be, have need blind admissions, have not been totally blind and they're, 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 
they, they've kind of worked to kind of keep their prices in line with one another. Uh, so there's some, some of the kind of allegations of a monopoly in that and that they're, they're really not being need blind. They're keeping a percentage of their class as you know, wealthy or whatever, this or that. Um, I, again, at face value, is it, all the trends, if you look at our financial aid distributions, um, in 1990, uh, just an undergraduate need-based financial aid, in 1990, we gave away $5 million in Notre Dame financial aid. Uh, this past year, I believe the number was $180 million that we gave directly in financial aid. So we have been, I think the average package this year, about 50% of our student body is on financial aid, and the average financial aid award is $55,000 annually. That has grown and increased. It has been, it was the largest goal in our last campaign. Um, and we raised just, we raised $1 billion, $9 million in undergraduate financial aid in the last campaign. By far the, the single largest objective and, and the single largest accomplishment. So everything that, that, how we're trending in that area defies what this lawsuit is, is purportedly about. Um, I think college admissions, it, my fear is the way they will go is that college admissions is, is fraught with, I mean, many different constituencies, right? Want to see more admitted here and less there, whatever. My guess is that, that, that the fear here is they'll try to uh, use a power of an anecdote or something like that to kind of embarrass universities. We'll see where this, this whole class action lawsuit goes, but uh, it's in good hands with our, our general counsel right now. But so far, Notre Dame has not been a poster child. Some of the other schools they've, they've pointed at more. Um, I don't know if you did anything. Just two observations. One is that uh, you can thank athletics for this. Um, in the past 20 years, at the NCAA level, we haven't adopted a piece of legislation that hasn't resulted in an antitrust lawsuit. So we yeah. really conditioned the university community to get sued on an antitrust basis, and for that, I apologize. The second is just a little point I want to make, because sometimes it gets lost in this. I, I could not be more proud of this university's commitment to providing undergraduate financial aid. And, and, and because of that aid, the average tuition paid by a student at Notre Dame, I don't know what the number is, but yeah. it's, it's significantly lower than the published rate. Um, I think it's 24,000. 24,000 versus the published rate because of the generosity of financial aid. We pay the published rate, athletics. For every scholarship we give, we pay the full amount to the university. That doesn't happen in a lot of places. State schools will frequently say, okay, we'll, we'll charge in-state rates for every student athlete regardless of whether they're in-state or not. Some waive tuition for student athletes. I'm really proud of the fact it's not easy, but we pay for every student athlete that we give a scholarship to is based on the full amount of tuition at Notre Dame. Okay, so in closing, before we close, what I wanna do is turn it back on you and thank you for being the greatest ambassadors for Notre Dame, mm -hmm. for taking this information, for understanding it and sharing it with your constituencies. For that, I say thank you. And now, do you have any, any last word you wanna say, either of you? Uh, I mean, I, I would say that um, things are so divisive and politically charged in, in our society today, across the board, in our church. Um, it, these, are, these are difficult times. We understand the role that we ask of you as leaders of, uh, of the clubs and everything else is not an easy task. You have a lot of people that are, we want to equip you with as much information as we have so that you can be the important ambassadors that you are. We're not asking you to, to, to do anything that you don't believe in and your heart is true and right. We're a human institution. We make mistakes. We don't always do things rightly, but I really believe we're striving in that original vision from Father Soren to be a difference maker in the world. And that's what I think sustains many of us here and the work that you do to get up every day, uh, to make that more true every day and to make a difference, to make an impact one life at a time. 
And, uh, and I thank you for, for being the leaders in that, that initiative. Yeah, I would just echo that. You, you are the ambassadors. You are the people who are seen in your communities as Notre Dame. I love doing this because we can give you information. Every Saturday during football, I do a session called Ask Jack. And people are typically very amazed that I'll answer any question that's asked in that session. I do that because I want you to have the information. You may not agree with it, but, but misinformation really hurts us. Yeah. And so my request of you is if you encounter something you don't like or something you disagree with, let us know. We give us the opportunity to say to you, here's why we did it. You, again, you may not agree with us, but let us give you the information that motivated the decisions. And finally, I've done this versions of this a lot of times with Lou. Always a pleasure because he is so effective. But this is the first time he kicked my butt with his socks. I'm a little disappointed. <laughs> Join me in thanking Jack and Lou. <laughs>